And welcome back to the show. This is the Michael Lewis Show. And today we've got Mark on the show. Now, Mark's been in the industry a very long time. He's a very established expert in the field. And um, he's pe- written and produced a number of a number of books, with his latest one being the Community... How do, how do you say it? Sorry. Cumulative Advantage. That's that's the one. I, I, I struggle sometimes with, with words, but yeah. Um, and... Uh, so I decided that we should have him on the show and we'd talk a little bit about Mark in and a little bit about his new book. Um, so first off, Mark, do you want to just tell us a little bit more about your background and how you uh, got to where you are now? Well, uh, you know, I, I started out um, as, a, as a journalism major, actually, in college. And uh, while I was in my undergrad, I <clears throat> took a marketing class and kind of fell in love with marketing and decided that's what I, that I wanted to do. And um, so I started, I did a little bit of work in journalism and then eventually started working in, in corporate communications for a big company and had to wait for a while for my opportunity to to get into marketing, but had a great career and uh, got to do a lot of great jobs and travel the world and got to do just about every kind of marketing job you can think of. And then in 2008, started my own uh, company, started to consult and teach, started to blog, and the blog kind of caught on, and that led to some books. Uh, and uh, I've written nine books, and they've all done uh, pretty well. And uh, the books led to speaking, so a, a, a big part of my income comes from speaking at least in normal times. Hopefully that'll come back soon. I'm actually going to be giving my first live paid talk this Friday in, uh, in Miami. So we'll see how that goes as we start to return to normal. It'll be fun. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I I also teach at uh, Rutgers university in, uh, in the New York city area area in America. Awesome. And where are you from, Mark? Where are you originally from? Uh, I'm originally from uh, Pittsburgh. It's a it's a t- city, pretty large city in the in uh, in the Northeast. And I live in Tennessee now. If you look at America, like this is this is uh, New York, and this is Florida, and I live right right in, right in my line, the line in my hand. Awesome, awesome. So you got to travel the world. Um, in your career leading up to transitioning over to your own business. What was that transition like over to your own business, first of all? Well, it was uh, it was kind of weird at first because um, one of the things I described in my book, Known, about personal branding is that when you work for a big company, so much of your identity is tied to your company. You know, like I was Mark from Alcoa. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine in Brazil. He used to work for Embraer. And he said, uh, uh, you know, I was was Luis from Embraer. And when I left Embraer, it was like I lost my last name. And um, I was the head of uh, e-commerce for this company. So I was the go-to person for everything about the internet. Uh, I was in charge of CRM and social media and digital marketing for the whole company. And then when I left, I was the go-to person for nothing. Uh, All these things that I had accomplished at this big company really uh, didn't matter anymore. Nobody knew about it. Nobody cared about it. And this veil of silence fell down. And so I had done some consulting on the side. So I knew, uh, I knew that I could do it. I, I knew I wanted to do it. Uh, but really in this world, everything that I accomplished in this company didn't matter. The only thing that matters is, are you known? Either you're known or you're not. And if you're known, then you get invited on the Michael Ellis podcast. If you're not, you might not be invited on a podcast. So being known in this world and working on your personal brand is very important. 
And, and that was really a good lesson for me as I was starting my own business. Awesome. So that kind of ties in to what essentially the book is about. So obviously known's about um, being known and the, well, I'm only guessing here because I haven't actually read the book known, but I'm guessing mm. the book known is about being known. Is it about how to be known? Yeah, well, you need to read it. <laughs> it's I, a, I know. It, 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 you know, I, I, uh, I mean, it's a big question because in this world today, if you want to be invited someplace to be a speaker, if you want to write a book, if you want a new job opportunity, if you want to raise money for your charity, uh, the people who are known have an advantage over the people who aren't known. And so I tried to explore, can anybody become known? And uh, I found that, the, yeah, that, that you can, that there's a pattern that occurs. I interviewed 97 different people from around the world who are known in their industry, and they all did the same four things. And so that's really what what the book was about. And um, it's a very, very popular book, and it's, it's helped thousands and thousands of people. Awesome. So your latest book, Community of Advantage, mm -hmm. now that's – it's um, it's all about being heard, correct? So well, yeah. Uh, so uh, in a way, it's sort of like the next step in in known. Really, it's like once you establish your personal brand, then uh, the unfortunate uh, realization in our world today is that even if you're doing great work, even if you're doing your best work. There's so much competition that chances are uh, you're going to be buried. And so how do we compete in that kind of a world where there's um, so much content out there? How do we build momentum? And so I did a lot of research and uh, did some of my own research and uh, sort of, again, found this pattern of how does momentum occur in this world? So if you're kind of stagnating, how do you get to the next level? So that's it's the, the, the idea of cumulative advantage comes from research that was in the field of sociology in the 1960s. And it shows that if you start with some small advantage, that you can build really unstoppable momentum. But uh, there are also ways that if you don't have the, that advantage, there are ways you can create that for yourself and begin uh, begin momentum on your own. So that's awesome. There. So I mean, obviously, known is is your most popular um, book out of your series of books that that you have. Uh, what are some of the other books that you've, you've wrote? Well, my first real book was uh, you know I, I had an idea. Oh, it's been. 11 years ago now, maybe 10, 11 years ago, that um, Twitter was becoming very popular. Uh, and, and the books up at the time were about sort of the mechanics of Twitter. You know, what are hashtags about and all that? And I, I didn't really like Twitter at first. It took me about six months to figure it out. And once I figured it out, I realized that it's sort of the most human-powered social media platform. And people were, were missing this idea. And I didn't want people to be so frustrated with Twitter as I was. So I, I wrote a little book about that, and that became very popular. Uh, it's called The Tao of Twitter, or Tao, T-A-O, of Twitter. And then uh, I wrote the first book on influence marketing called Return on Influence. And uh, that was my first book published by a big publisher. It was published by McGraw-Hill. And then I wrote a couple other books uh, over the years. and. Um, uh, I wrote content code about content marketing and this idea that content really doesn't have any value unless it's seen and heard. The content has to move. It has to ignite. That's really where power comes from in our world is getting that content to move. Then I wrote known about personal branding, 
which was popular and marketing rebellion, which is uh, right there over my shoulder was also a hugely popular book, kind of a wake up call um, that uh, the way uh, consumers relate to brands and businesses today is it's much different. We've got the accumulated knowledge of the human race in the palm of our hands and, and uh, people have a much different expectation about how they want to connect with brands. And uh, then uh, this year, uh, just a few weeks ago, I came out with Cumulative Advantage. So that's the short story about my books. That's the short story. No, that's, that's awesome. Um, so you, you mentioned there that uh, Twitter is a human-driven social media platform. What do you mean by a human-driven social media platform? What was, what was different about Twitter in 2008 when you released that book from the other social media platforms then? Facebook was just coming about of age at that time. I mean, it was still in it. Yeah, I mean, Twitter, I mean, my book, I think Twitter started gaining steam around 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first tried it, it, you know, I mean, Twitter is, it, it, it's it's a wall of noise. It's it's ephemeral. These, these tweets, these messages are just zooming past you. And it didn't really make sense. And then... Uh, this was a time when we were having, uh, I guess it was the last pandemic. It was the swine flu. And in certain parts of the world, the swine flu was, was, it was getting pretty serious. But the pork industry didn't want anybody to call it the swine flu. They said, this is going to hurt our brand. We need to come up with another name. So one night I was bored and I saw on Twitter there was a hashtag, a trending topic called new name for flu. So I clicked on it and people from around the world were giving all these funny names to the swine flu, like uh, like the apocalypse and uh, hamthrax. And, you know, I'll never forget it because I was just sitting there laughing so hard at how creative and fun all the people on Twitter were. And then I had this realization that I was watching a real time global collaboration. And, and, and I'd never really seen that before. I didn't see it on YouTube. I didn't see it on Facebook people from around the world were gathering in on fun and they were telling jokes in a way, but I thought you could use this sort of collaboration for anything. You could generate ideas for almost anything. And it just, it, it was a very profound moment for me that we had this global communion around one topic and that there was vast potential for us as individuals for our businesses, really for, you know, governments. And, uh, you know, whether that's fulfilled as promised or not is, a, is another discussion. But, I mean, at that time, it was a kind of a very profound realization that this power, it's not driven by a platform, it's driven and by people. And, and that was this just huge, huge opportunity uh, and, uh, and, and, and really that, that was the, the main idea of my first book. So with that realization, did you realize that marketing on social media had to be different from traditional marketing or did that come with the research behind the book? Well, the first book really wasn't so much a marketing book. I mean, there are some ideas in there about how you can use Twitter for business. But back in the early days of social media, um, if you think about it, there's a lot of debate right now about how brands should show up on Clubhouse. Brands are mostly terrified by Clubhouse. Because it's 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 raw, it's unfiltered. Uh, you know, you can't take it back. Uh, it's 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 is live and it's in the moment. And and 
it's for it's for the same reason that a lot of big companies are are really worried about live streaming and the liability that might come with live streaming. Well, that's the way it was uh, with social media in the early days. Companies really were trying to figure it out. It took them a long time to figure it out. Um, some of the early thought leaders on the social media scene were totally against using social media for any kind of business purpose. They just thought, you know, social media is for the people. It should be pure. If companies get involved, they're going to ruin it. And, you know, perhaps in some ways they have. So, you know, my perspective at that time, I had worked in marketing for a big company for many, many years. So I could see social media for, for, through a different lens. And I think that's what made some of my early writing popular because I had all this marketing experience and I could connect the dots between uh, good, sound, fundamental marketing ideas and then the new opportunities of social media. And I mean, you know, maybe I was one of the first people to do that because, as I said, the early, the early bloggers, I mean, the first content creators were bloggers and they were, they were really against uh, businesses participating, uh, on social media. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I saw the opportunity and, and, uh, really started to connect the dots in that way. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so can you quickly give us a, a quick rundown on, on, on personal branding before we move into talking a little bit more about, yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah newly released book yeah like, what would you like to know well how does somebody establish a personal brand um from from zero from nothing because you, mm. that's that's your personal experience anyway um mm. you 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 left the corporate world and started up your own business and quickly realized that you needed to build up a personal brand is it different well, from back then? Well, no, no. I mean, I think everybody has a personal brand, whether you like it or not. A personal brand is what people think about you from based on their observations and their experience. So someone might think of you and say, you know, you're creative, you're generous, you're, you know, you're punctual you're, you know, full of good ideas. And so people are observing that. And so really what creating a personal brand on, on the web is about is, is, is kind of amplifying you at your best. And so it, it, so how do you do that? There's really only, way, only one way to do that. And that's to create original content of some kind. It's not, it doesn't have to be confusing. It doesn't have to be uh, overwhelming, but you have to write something. You have to create video. You have to create a podcast. You have to create something visual that might be on, on Instagram, for example. And, it, and you don't have to do all of that. In fact, most people and uh, most businesses have to be pretty selective. They can only choose, um, you know, one, one or two things. You can't be great in five places and whatever you choose, you've got to be great uh, because there's so much competition out there. And so it's really about, you know, working on your personal brand. You have to be very mindful about what you want to be known for. You need to be clear on what you want to be known for. If you're going to tell a story out in the world about you, and connect with people in a personal way. You've got to be clear about why, you know, why are you special? What do you want to be known for? And then you have to, you know, in my book, I encourage people to think about where they want to do it, how they want to do it, and then how you develop uh, a, a, an active audience that can help you make your dreams come true. Having a, a bunch of Twitter followers isn't necessarily going to activate your business. They are not going to necessarily hire you because 
Generally speaking, those are weak relational links. But the people who follow me on my blog, they read my content every day. They have a stronger emotional connection to me. And so those people who consume your content, who subscribe to your content, are the active audience that you want to grow and nurture over time. So those are kind of the basic steps of creating a personal brand today. So just quickly, um, do you believe just relying on social media is going to get a business where they want to be? Um, or, or do they have to create some kind of pillar content? So I podcast a YouTube channel or a blog being the free main pillar online content, um, categories they is today? Well, I think, you know, there are a few exceptions, but <clears throat> I think generally speaking, um, social media is, is really a, a, a distribution system. Um, you, for if uh, I'll get, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, that was a great lesson to me many years ago when influence marketing was first starting to uh, become popular and people were first starting to talk about it. It was, it was very controversial, but I was fascinated by it. So I wrote a blog post talking about this new trend. And uh, about three weeks after I wrote the article, I got a call from a reporter from the New York Times. And she said, Mr. Schaefer, I'm interested in this new marketing trend called influence marketing. I did a, a Google search for this topic and I found your blog post. And I'd like to interview you for the New York Times. Can I interview you? Yes, of course. So my words and my ideas showed up in the Sunday New York Times business section. And that article is syndicated by newspapers all around the country and all around the world. So now this article is like in all these papers all over the world. Now, I had a lot of ideas in those early days about influence marketing. And if I just, if I just sent out a tweet and said, oh, you know, I'm interested in influence marketing. Would she have ever found me? No. If I posted on Facebook and said, oh, I have these ideas about influence marketing. Would she have found me in the Google search? No. Or if I posted on LinkedIn? No. There's got to be some original idea, something, some kind of content that's, that's, that's discoverable to really get your ideas out in, into the world. And that's what we talked about, you know, something written like a blog or video or audio, or maybe today something visual that might be on Pinterest or, or Instagram. That's possible, I think. So generally you, you need to, to, to find, you know, one core thing that, that you love, that's going to bring you joy. Cause you're going to, you know, you, you can't just create one blog post and expect things to happen. You've got to do it week after week and year after year. Um, you know, I blogged for 650 straight weeks. I've had a podcast for, for nine years. We're going to be going into our 10th year in a, in a few weeks. And, and I've never missed an episode. And so, and, and so I become a habit with people. They look for my blog every week. They look for my podcast, you know, every, every two weeks. And they get to know me. And they get to know what I stand for. They get to know the way I think. And eventually they buy my books. They hire me. Maybe I do a workshop for their company. And that's how it works. So moving on to um, on, on to the book. What are the, some of the general key uh, points to, to, the, to, to the community advantage? Cumulative advantage. Well, again, I mean, this is really about, you know, we live in this world today where, 
you, you know, even if you're doing great work, there's so much competition that you may be buried. So how do we, how do we build uh, momentum? So uh, I went really back into research that started in the 1960s that showed uh, how people in business, in athletics, entertainment, tech, how they build this momentum. And there, there is sort of this system, there's this pattern that repeats over and over again. And uh, momentum starts with pursuing an idea, pursuing some curiosity. And this is important because a lot of people have ideas, but if you don't pursue that idea, then there's not gonna be any momentum. It's just a worthless idea. So you need to pursue the idea. It Somehow it has to fit with some emerging need in the world to, cre to really get the momentum going. So something has changed, something has shifted. And we see this a lot right now in our world where we have this uh, pandemic. We have the biggest fracture in the status quo, arguably in the history of, of the human race, where everything has changed. How we work, how we learn, how we entertain ourselves, how we educate our kids, you know, even how we work out, it's all being changed. And when you have big shifts like that, or even little shifts that are occurring, those all represent business opportunities. Now, I'll give you a, a, a quick example. I saw in the, in the news last week that um, we have this big uh, greeting card company here in America. I, I, they're probably global. I don't know. It's called Hallmark Cards. Have you heard of Hallmark Cards? Okay. Yeah, we have them over here. In the UK. So I saw this article, uh, I believe it was in the Wall Street Journal. It said Hallmark Cards is going to end their e-cards. Now, the whole world is moving toward e-commerce. And the biggest greeting card company in the world is ending e-commerce. That makes no sense. What's going on? So I pursued my curiosity and I read all the way down to the bottom of the article. And it said there are two big demographics for greeting cards. One is elderly people. They don't like sending greeting cards over a computer. But the other big demographic is young people. They like to send cards, but they like handcrafted sort of artisanal cards that mean something. So now think about there's a change. And, uh, Hallmark tried something. The whole world's going to e-commerce. It didn't work. What I'm reading is that people want these handcrafted cards. Now, if I'm an artist and I'm learning Gen Z likes to send out these handcrafted cards. Maybe I get on the TikTok and create content about how I make these handmade cards. That could start a whole new business, right? Because I learned something new. There's an opportunity. There's a shift in the world. And then the next step is really about building awareness. And then and then another good way to build momentum is to is to maybe look for opportunities to get help from someone who's already there, someone that can open doors for you or make introductions for you. And, uh, and then the final step is you've got to make good decisions and have the discipline to keep the momentum going. And sometimes that means you got to be resilient. You got to, you got to tough out the hard times. You can't, you know, panic and, and, and shift uh, when things go wrong. Uh, so you've got to have the discipline to do, to make good decisions and keep the momentum going. And so it's a fun book. Uh, a, a lot of people love it. A lot of people have been very inspired by it. And, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. It's helping a lot of people. How long did it take you to write this book? It, it takes me about two years to 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 write to to write and 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 publish the book. It, it, it starts 
with a with an idea, but it's got to be a big idea because it's such a sacrifice and and such a commitment that it's 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 got to be something that I believe in. And then you know I start I do an outline to think about well what do I think these chapters would contain? And then over a period of about nine months or so, I'll, I'll just do research and, and I'll be, I'll, I'll just look around and watch, uh, you know, who are people I should interview? What articles are, are out there? What podcasts are out there? What research is out there? And I'll start collecting all this stuff. And then when it's time to write, I sort of open up my files. I see what I have. And I weave the stories in, in, into the book. And it goes through, uh, you know, there's no such thing as good writing, only good rewriting. So I write and write and write and write and then do it over again. And then I send it through a couple different editors. So I get different perspectives on things. And then um, I send it through a final editor, uh, a person that I've worked with and she checks every single piece of grammar. She checks every single fact. She makes sure everything, every name is spelled correctly. And she's, you know, so now it's like, you know, polished to it until it's perfect. And then, you know, we do the layout and we do the cover and I record the audio version. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big project. It, it takes about two years to do the whole thing. Yeah, well, from the way you were talking about it and the way you were um, talking about research and, and all these things, I can tell it's a big project. It, it's not just one of those books that's been bashed out in 30 days or in two months. Um, two years is a long, it's a long commitment. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not working on it necessarily, you know, every day. Yeah. Um, the, the actual writing process might take, uh, you know, two, three months to actually write it. But, you know, you've, by the time I start, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of got everything ready, ready to go. And then I really, I really, you know, push it. And then, of course, then the editors come in and they tell me I need to do things over and... <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it, it it takes a tremendous amount of effort, a tremendous amount of sacrifice. You know, I can remember there's one story at the beginning of the book. It's about two pages long, but it's an important story. And uh, I remember uh, coming out of my office one day and talking to my wife, and I said, "Nobody will, will, will would ever believe I just spent three days." writing this story that is two pages in the book because you know i just there was just so many things to bring together and to and to make it really right and so i read and read and read and read and went down all these rabbit holes and got all these facts and weaved together a narrative that had never really been weaved together before um but so it's it, it's it to do it right it's a tremendous amount of work and i think I'm at a point now where a lot of people will buy my book simply because they know I wrote it. They trust me. They know if I write a book, it's going to be good. It's going to be uh, well-researched. It's going to be fun to read. And so, uh, you know, when I write a book, it's not something that I'm just going to pound out. It's going to be something that's very bold and original and also beautiful. Uh, I want everything about it to be beautiful. I want the layout to be beautiful. I want it to be really entertaining, uh, and I want it to be right. So uh, I, it's 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 definitely a, 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 a you know a handcrafted product. So obviously you got the book, the podcast, uh, the the books, the podcast, the blog. Um, do you do you do video as well, Mark? I, I haven't done much video um, for, for two reasons. Um, one is what I mentioned earlier is that 
I, I, when I create content, whether it's a blog post or a podcast or a book, there's only one thing in my mind. And that is, I, I will never let you down. If you spend time with my content, it will always be relevant, interesting, timely, entertaining. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's worth your time. Um, and I, you know, I blogged for five years before I started the podcast because I wanted to create a podcast in a way that it would never jeopardize the quality of the blog. And um, so I am I, I am thinking about doing more video. I have not been consistent about that. But to do video, it's the same sort of thing. I've got to find a way to do video in a way that's consistent that's helpful, that's, that, that will not let people down. And it all also has to be something that I enjoy doing. It'll have to be fun uh, because if I'm not having fun, people, you know, people will be able to tell. People will be able to tell. And not only that, you'll have a lot harder time being consistent when you're not having right. fun. You're, yeah, you'll quit. It's just a, a given of life. Um, yeah. So, what's your podcast called, Mark? Marketing Companion. Oop, I dropped out there. The Marketing yeah. Companion, did you say? Marketing Companion, yeah. Yeah. And the 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 blogs over at businessesgrow.com, yeah? Right, yeah. Um, and that's also where they can uh, pick up your book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, guys, if you head over to businessesgrow.com, uh, you can follow along with, with uh, and, and catch up with Mark with all the content that he produces. There's a link on there to the Marketing Companion podcast, uh, or you can just search it up on, the, on, on your preferred podcast player. Um, and that's co-host with a, another host, isn't it? Yes, um, so. I do it with I do it with Brooks Brooks Sellis. Yeah, she's been my friend for a long time, and uh, we have a lot of fun. We you know we always get each other laughing on that show, and uh, you know sometimes it gets out of control, but it's it's a it's it's a, it's a very entertaining show. I think it's the most entertaining business podcast anywhere. So yeah, definitely go check that out um, on, on your preferred podcast player. Uh, go check Mark's blog out because there's a lot of helpful content on there for for you guys to, to be able to read, get to know him more, and get to know his ideas more. Which um, the original ideas they're not they're not ideas that are copied from other people and just re reworked and re uh, and reworded. Mark's the original the OG. Um, and <laughs> so I don't know if that's uh, good. You know that you're going to be getting content off him. That's uh, it's, it's, it's worthy of your time. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's very kind of you to say, thanks. Thanks for having me on your show today. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, Mark. Um, is there any, any last final words you want to, uh, to get out there on the show? Well, you know, uh, I think, Everybody in some way has been suffering through the the, the pandemic, and uh, you know we've we've had to we've had to tough it out. And a lot of people have have uh, been missing a lot, and even grieving ways of life or grieving people who have been sick or people that we've lost. So, you know, I just want to encourage people to just keep fighting to the other side. That um, you know uh, we're uh, we just. Right now, the biggest thing we can do is just land, is to arrive and, uh, you know, hang in there. And uh, hopefully, you know, we're st we've still got a lot of problems around the world. But here in America, we're, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, you know, hopefully things will be back soon. So thanks, Michael, for having me. And thanks for everyone for, for listening today. And I will see you on the next, the next show, guys. Thanks for watching.